Hi, uh, hi everyone. I'm Kathy Chute. I'm the exec executive director of the Institute for Applied Computational Science here, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Yael Grushka Kokain from Harvard Business School. She's a visiting associate professor there this year, and we're delighted to have her come speak at our regular seminar series. Um, I've, I've actually gotten to know Yael a little bit the last month or so because she was a star speaker at a Women in Data Science conference that we had uh, held jointly with MIT uh, back in the beginning of March, and she's also doing some work with us at Harvard with. A the joint program that we do with the engineering school and FAS and the business school on business analytics. So, a uh, welcome, Yael. She's got. She's got. She was. At, she's been at UVA, University of Virginia, for quite a long time. Has won lots of awards, and she does really interesting research on um, data science forecasting, project management, and behavioral decision making. So, thanks and welcome, Yael. Allowed. I, right, exactly. I have a loud voice. Okay, can you guys hear me in the back? I think I'm, I'm actually using the mic now, uh, so hopefully it sounds okay and there's no too much, not too much echo. Um, I thank you for inviting me, first of all. It's nice to uh, be on this side of the river sometimes. Um, I am used to a dialogue, so kind of interactive. Uh, session. This is, uh, I'm presenting here work that is, the, pro the main project is done, uh, Heathrow implementation is off and running, so that part is kind of mostly under, under control, but we're in the process of revising the paper for a resubmission to a journal, we got some good feedback, we're always looking to improve the paper, the paper's out there, and so I would love your feedback because anything you say will be helpful to me as we kind of refine the main points and the main delivery, so please stop me ask questions, we'll try and do this interactive, we'll try and make it an interesting session so it's not just me talking at you but it's, it's a back and forth and you don't have to postpone any questions till the end. Okay, can we do that? Yes. I'll make me more comfortable so I'm very selfish at requesting that. Um, so thank you again for inviting me. This is a, a project that I hope uh, most of you will find uh, something interesting in it, uh, mainly because uh, we all fly through airports, right? Do anybody not like flying? Okay. I wonder, is it the flying itself or is it the airport experience? Airlines. Airlines, okay. Airport. Airports, okay. So we'll hear a little bit maybe, maybe you will find a different angle in this, in this work. Um, but this is all about working with, um, uh, this specific project is working with Heathrow on trying to uh, help them with their prediction tasks. I wanted to kind of take a moment just to tell you a little bit of the backdrop, why I'm involved in this, how does it relate to other stuff I've been doing, and how did I get uh, to be on this project. And so if you see on the slide, there's a lot of different logos here. I used to have a UVA one too. I took it off because there were just too many logos. But um, as Kathy mentioned, I am a, an associate professor at the University of Virginia. I'm on a leave of absence for two years from the University of Virginia. I'm here visiting at the business school for two years. This work has been done jointly with um, co-authors of mine, two co-authors, Shauja and Bert. Shauja Gu is a PhD student, and Bert de Rijk is um, the director of University College London's uh, School of Management. He was also my PhD advisor when I was doing my PhD a long, long time ago, and so we've collaborated ever since, and so this is one of those joint projects. Now, interestingly, my PhD dissertation, a long time ago, when I was in London, was, work, was based on work that was done with Eurocontrol. Does anybody know who Eurocontrol are? Are you familiar with that organization at all? Okay, so uh, FAA. Folks are familiar with the FAA? Okay, so the FAA is the, basically the body in the US in charge of aviation, right? In charge of everything to do with um, air traffic controllers, a lot of the regulation, a lot of the, the, the governance of the air traffic uh, is done by the FAA here in the US. Eurocontrol is the equivalent body in Europe. Okay, now, it's interesting because Eurocontrol, large organization, European Union organization, work primarily out of Brussels and out of, uh, uh, in France. Um, they do a lot of the research related to developments in the field. They do a lot of um, strategy and conceptualizing. They do not have the same type of regulatory approval or regulatory kind of capabilities and authorities that the FAA have. They're a nice to have organization that helps a lot of other in individual organizations, but Euro European airspace in general is a hugely fragmented environment. 
okay? And this is a really important part of the, the setup because a lot of the work that I've been doing, gosh, over the past, I wanna say 13, 14 years now has to do with the fact that the European airspace is ridiculously fragmented and ridicu ridiculously uncoordinated uh, to the point where if I tell you a little bit, maybe too much today, you may not wanna fly over Europe, okay? So I'll try and kind of keep it upbeat and positive, but um, uh, you know, all the different countries, we have the European Union, but the airports and the airlines and the air traffic controllers are all separate entities. Some of them public or some of them run by the government, some of them are privately uh, run, and they are not necessarily obliged to communicate or to standardize protocols across those different boundaries. And so what we have are a lot of initiatives to try and come to a uniform system, but it's not quite there yet. When I got involved with Eurocontrol all of those years ago, my main work was about coming up with a multi-stakeholder decision-making approach to, to unifying the airspace to a vision that they called um, the single European sky, okay? At the time when I was doing my dissertation, 2005, six, seven, they were talking about the single European sky materializing around 2020. Of course, lo and behold, when you go and check the documents today, 2030, you know, it's been pushed away, it's been postponed, so we're not quite there yet, but there's a lot of activities that try and get us to the single European sky, okay? And this project was kind of brought to our attention, or we got reeled in through Eurocontrol. They're saying we're still trying to kind of help progress this notion of a single European sky. There has been some progress. So there are collaborative tools that are, uh, that are helping the airlines and the airports collaborate much better. There are efforts around airports to come up with something called an APOC, an airport operating center that brings in all the different stakeholders to a single room. Imagine that we, in this room we had all the different stakeholders. These APOCs are now becoming more common. And these APOC centers, these rooms, these collaborative centers are part of the output from the single European sky initiative. And so Eurocontrol came to me and Bert and said, hey, we have these APOCs, it took us years, we put together rooms, we have all the stakeholders sitting in the same room, but they don't do anything about that. They don't use it in any clever way. Let's see if we can push the boundaries of how they use their physical presence with how they use their data, with how they make decisions to push the needle on that collaboration and that efficiency that is to be gained. Is that so far everybody understands kind of the drama behind this, the story behind it? Okay, let's see if I can make it even more clear, okay? So I, I like to start off uh, this talk and I think I asked something similar when we were at the, at the women's uh, in data science conference. Has anybody specifically visited Heathrow in this room? Have you flown through Heathrow? Oh, quite a few, okay? How were your experiences through Heathrow? Anything memorable? <clears throat> Long line. You have this button, you have to press how satisfied you are, right? Yes, there's buttons to... And what did you press? The green one. The green, okay, so you were satisfied. Okay, good. one satisfied customer, he remembers pressing the green, good, yes. They have these measures in their APOC, you can see those green smiles, yes. Connection. You missed the connection. Oh, no, where were you going to? Paris Charles de Gaulle. To Paris, Charles de Gaulle, and what happened? Were you late coming in, or? I was late coming into Heathrow, I missed the connection. Um, it was too far to get to the other gate. It was too far to get to the other gate. So it's a big airport. You flew into Terminal 5, do you remember, or? I think it might have been 5, yes. Okay, good. So we have one missed connection. Not good, but it's good for my project, because hopefully I'll, at least you'll be acclaimed for why we need to solve the problem, yeah. This might be an outlier, but there was a work, a airline workers strike, so I had to spend the night on the floor. Oh, geez, that is an outlier. Who was striking? Uh, it was British Air. British Air, okay. So what's interesting, um, so thank you for the, any other notable experiences that are important to kind of cast? More than 30 minutes on the bus from the terminal to the airplane. <laughs> oh, okay. So you weren't walking, you were on the bus and you got stuck? I mean, Lost. very far. Okay, so it's a, big, it's a big airport geographically and you have to kind of bus the passengers from place to place. So it's that T that I'm gonna be obsessively predicting, my Delta T, okay can be quite long, okay? So you're one of those tail T, T numbers in my, in my distribution. Yeah, uh, I, in defense of Heathrow, was five hours late on my Tunis air flight, but it was so cheap, I don't think people should complain. I took the train, free Wi-Fi, it worked just fine. I think that, you know, inflation-adjusted flight prices have gone down, and we should look at these things as nicer bus stations as opposed to a luxury experience, and 
people is getting paid for. It. There you go. It's a miracle they get us up in the sky. It's a miracle they get us back on the ground. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got it right. You know, Wi-Fi was free. I, I had nothing to complain about. <laughs> so, um, so that's okay. Fair enough. Another perspective. Uh, so that's interesting to hear all these different perspectives. Misconnection, long durations, good smiley face experiences, and, and, and also some notion of there's other stuff that we get along the process that we should really put it in perspective how we treat the airports today. I want to kind of give you a little, little bit more information. So most airports in the world are not, not profitable. Most of them are also owned by the government, okay? So they're publicly owned airports, they're not privatized, and they're typically very, very expensive to run, okay? Heathrow is a kind of one, what makes interest, Heathrow interesting in my mind is Heathrow is actually a, so, a wholly privatized uh, airport. So it is privately run by the Heathrow company, so that's the company that runs the airport. It costs, and I'm going to write this number on the board, okay, it costs $1,485,600,000. A year to run the airport. Okay, that's what it costs to run the airport. So it's a huge, huge in, uh, operational nightmare. Okay, it's like it's running several companies. Okay, Heathrow themselves employ 6,000, 6,500 employees that they actually have a paycheck that they have to pay to. But in the Heathrow eco space, if you add all the other companies, like for instance, BA, British Airways, are not Heathrow employees, but if you ha add everybody else to the mix, we're talking about just under 80,000 people, 80,000 people that interact with Heathrow on a daily basis, okay? This thing is massive, okay? If there are any PhD students in the room, no PhD students in the room? Master students in the room? No students in the room? A few master, okay, good. If you're looking for projects, okay, this is a rich environment because there's so many problems they need to solve, so, so much money that they're spending that they really are in need of improving their operations, okay? Um, and so Heathrow, private company, lots of money that it spends high cost to run. It needs to make money on each and every passenger, and we'll talk a little bit where that comes in the mix and how that might affect the way that they think about their op operation in general uh, and how they think about the process that passengers take throughout the airport and all of these experiences that you guys mentioned. Okay, so I mentioned my co-authors, I mentioned uh, how I got involved. So the idea was come help us understand a little bit more about how we can improve our decision making in the APOC, how can we use big data, how can we use data in general, and how can we use machine learning to maybe improve the way that we think about the experience of the passenger at the airport. Now, if you needed a motivation for this project beyond the anecdotes that we heard in class, I, uh, in the room today, I don't know if anybody saw, did anybody see this recent headline this week? It was like this week, right? <laughs> Last week, when was it? Recently, right? So a BA flight, so a British Airways flight, landed in not only the wrong city, okay? Not only the wrong country, but it's like a separate island, like it's a separate place, right? So an uh, uh, airplane took off and landed in the wrong place. Admittedly, it wasn't from Heathrow, so I'll, I'll kind of put that out there. But the reason that was cited, did you read why it, got, um, it landed by mistake? Did anybody notice this? Well, it said here, the flight paperwork was submitted incorrectly. <laughs> paperwork. Okay, this is not like 1980s, okay? We're talking about paperwork, and I am here to attest that a lot of the work that still gets done in the air traffic control, among the air traffic controllers, in the towers, among, in the airlines, and in the airports is all very old fashioned, very uh, much down to a paperwork kind of clerical error, and not enough digital transformation, if you will, taking place in the space. And it's a hard thing to overcome, and there's reasons why there's barriers for, progress, for, for progression, but this is an issue that we need to remind ourselves that we're talking about an industry that really kind of peaked in its evolution in the kind of 70s and 80s, and it has really struggled to progress beyond, especially because of the fragmentation. Yeah. The pilot got the wrong paperwork? The, uh, the whole process did it wasn't, wasn't in the know, because there's a whole process when the pilots take off, they're given the information, you know, they have those sheets of paper, they 
type in the destination and they go. And you, the passengers thought that it was a joke when the pilot said we're on our way. Like the passengers thought that it was a joke. Sometimes have you ever been on a flight like Delta always jokes around landing in the wrong destination, right? So they, nobody really picked up on the fact that they were just tip, actually flying it to the wrong place. So this is a problem that needs to be solved, and that's what I'm here to do. I spoke to you a little bit about the magnitude of Heathrow. Uh, Heathrow is about the sixth busiest airport in the world, okay? Uh, in Europe, it is the biggest airport, um, the busiest airport in, in Europe. I think the busiest airport in the world is um, Atlanta, okay? No, Chicago is like number five, okay? Atlanta is the busiest one. Um, and millions of passengers to fly through Heathrow. Heathrow is really the gateway to many different places. One of the reasons it has so many people flying into it are those connecting passengers. What was your name? Uh, missing, missed connection? What was your name? Uh, Atticus. 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 Like Atticus, a lot of people connect through, uh, through Heathrow. Heathrow is one of the only airports that actually has direct flights to all six continents. So it, you can fly from Heathrow everywhere in the world. And so a lot of folks fly into Heathrow and connect from there. And our, you'll see in a moment that one of the issues that we're going to try and solve is really focused on these connecting passengers because they have their own journey through the airport and their own set of experiences. Uh, this has four terminals. They've been constantly working on, on one of their terminals. Right now, they're, technically, they have five, although I think they finished all five renovations. The fifth ter terminal was opened especially for the Olympics and has been very successful. Um, and they have an issue with being at capacity, 650 flights a day. They really don't have anywhere to grow. Uh, they cannot accommodate any more flights. There's a big uh, debate in England around opening a third runway and expanding Heathrow. I'm not going to cover that in the conversation, but that's something in the background that you should know is also ongoing. This is a picture from the APOC, a picture that we took uh, when we were there. So this, Heathrow is also one of the only APOCs in the world. So it's moved forward with the Euro control kind of vision around uh, putting all the stakeholders in one room. Charles de Gaulle has an APOC as well that is pretty advanced, but this was one of the first ones that opened in 2014. The different parties, and I'll give you more data on this, the different stakeholders all sit in one room and can observe the entire operations of the airport from one physical facility. You know, we see all these operation rooms in the movies sometimes. It kind of feels like that, but with a lower ceiling. Um, and so they have these screens that, uh, that constantly monitor arrivals, they monitor security, they monitor the baggage, they monitor safety, they monitor a lot of different aspects of the operations of the airport. Um, here are some roles in the, in the APOC, and everything that is purple, you can tell the Heathrow color is this purple color, and so anything that, I, that you see this high purple, this very specific kind of lilac-y purple, this is all images that we got from Heathrow, and it's easy also to understand where the stakeholder, where the responsibility, the decision-making responsibility lies. So these are, so this is the APOC, the Airport Operating Center. Part of the Operating Center includes all of these managers, all of these decision makers. So decision makers related to safety, the police, um, retail decision makers, anybody to do with the retail space. So Heathrow, I told you, needs to make money for each and every passenger that comes through its doors to cover that one billion dollars. And so the way that Heathrow does it is by running one of the better and the more sophisticated retail spaces in among all airports, okay? So there's a whole sector of decision makers related to the, to the retail, if that's the food, the, the restaurants, the, the shopping, et cetera. You have a whole team and a manager in charge of baggage, everything to do with transporting the baggages to the airplanes and also then uh, getting the bags off the airplanes and onto co the conveyors. There's a team in charge of all of the decisions related to the baggage. Um, aircraft, assets, meaning the buildings themselves, security, and the passengers themselves. Every single function has a set of teams, stakeholders that are either Heathrow employees, third party uh, individuals, or other contractors that are involved. This is a beast in terms of the number of entities that interact with each other. Okay. As you can imagine, a lot of these entities have their own set of systems, databases, uh, algorithms, uh, protocols related to how they look at data and how do they make decisions. And most of the data that they have is fairly 
old fashioned, meaning it's fairly um, uh, retrospective and it's not proactive. So most of the data that they use in the APOC is yesterday's data. Okay, yesterday's data or last week's data with some kind of forecast about what's about to happen, but very little data is available real time. Okay, so let me give you a couple of specific examples of decision makers and the type of data that they don't have real time that they would like to have that could help their decision making process. So a couple of these managers, for instance, the security flow manager. This security flow manager can make real time adjustments to the resourcing plan. There are security guards, there's a, a lot of security kind of around the airport. As more flights land, as the, air, as the terminals become more and more crowded, this manager can make adjustments to the, to the level of the security individuals at the different terminals. But it would be useful for that individual to have the information about not what he planned, not what he woke up thinking would happen, but real time what has landed, how many passengers have, have gone off the planes, where are they headed, how many are headed towards immigrations and are about to leave the airport, how many are staying within the airport, like Atticus are missed the connection and we have to cater to them, okay? There are many different, um, there's a lot of stuff he could do with that information, but he didn't have it at the time that we started this project. Similarly, the passenger flow manager. The passenger flow manager is the, is the manager in charge of the passenger activity. So when you get off the, the plane, and for instance, if you're late for a flight and you can make it, you know those little cars that can speed up and come and get you? We want somebody, or this passenger flow manager is in charge of making sure that that is at the gate when you land. They're in charge of ha helping the passengers flow through the terminal to make their destination, be that leave Heathrow or make the connection to a di at a different terminal. And so this manager, again, they can control um, staffing, they can control border support, uh, border uh, forces, airlines themselves tell the airline when, how much to be delayed, how long to wait for these passengers that just landed. So this manager is in charge of communicating between the different airlines to help them get all the passengers to where they need to be on time. And again, the passenger flow manager needs individual level predictions. Who's landed? When will they hit the, uh, the border control desk? When will they hit the security desk? Will they stand a chance of, missing their, uh, of making their flight or should we just take off and let them miss the flight? And then what do we do with them, okay? So these are the managers, these are the individuals that have the responsibility in the APOC and they need real time data to support that. And so um, this is what we, they want to see, smiles, happy faces, purple vests, everybody's happy. And like Atticus, they end up in long lines, stuck, missing their flights, and not satisfied. And Heathrow wants those smiley faces. They want the green. They want everybody to uh, leave on time. But more than that, what does, Heathrow, what does Heathrow want to know? Or what is the, Heathrow's goal if you think about their objectives? They want the smiley faces. They want people to, to not miss their connections. But uh, what else do they, might they want along the way? They, they want, want them to spend money. They want them to spend a lot of money. And so they want them to spend something around, probably, you know, they get a cut from every sale. They need to make on each one of us something around 19 to $20, okay? So they want them through this process as soon as they can, even if they miss their flight. So they're sitting in their retail area, they're sitting in the shopping area, and they're spending the money, okay? And so they have a very specific objective of funneling these people as soon as possible and identifying where people go when they leave the plane and getting them through immigration, through security as fast as they can to an area where they either are on a plane leaving or they're spending money. The customer journey, so people arrive at terminals two, three, or four at the time that we did this terminal one was closed, or they passenger arrive at terminal five. Once they arrive, once people you know, leave the plane, the problem is that Heathrow has no clue where they go. If you think about it, you get off the plane, and who knows where you're gonna go? You can go to the bathroom, you can go, you know, you can pause and wait for your, Right, you would think. Right, because they have enough. They don't have to, any. Because you capability. could easily identify somebody stepping off in gate E5B or whatever that must have come off of that flight within a certain window. If you could have done that, this entire project would be useless. 
Well, I wish you could do this. In fact, it is so difficult for me to even know 30 minutes to even 30 minutes, like an hour, two hours, you'll see, I'll show you a chart, but I don't even know who's about to land, okay? So they don't always know what airplane is about to land with who on board. And there is no way for Heathrow, no way to track individuals once they leave the plane. The only hope that they have is that when they come to something called the conformance desk, which is right here at the end of my chart, at the conformance desk, connecting passengers have to scan their next boarding pass. That's the only checkpoint that Heathrow has that the passengers actually got off the plane and made it somewhere notable. But you could force a passenger to give your incoming flight information in exchange for free Wi-Fi, and you would probably get like 95% compliance, right? Somebody might make up something, but you could assume statistically that it was correct. It right? sounds beautiful. It sounds lovely. I think you could. Because there, I mean, I've been there, you have to log into the free Wi-Fi. Right? They don't. You're right, but they don't, okay? You could incentivize a lot of different, in a lot of different ways. They, did not, they are not doing that, okay? And in fact, also in the US, the airlines and the airports do not collaborate in that way to make sure that they have as many checkpoints as they can about a person's whereabouts. They just don't track you at that level. Because privacy standards are very weak in Britain compared to the US, right? Well, that's I mean, changing too, that's changing too, okay? So it's not as easy to execute on. You're right, in theory, you would think that this day and age, it, it's all automated. When I get off a plane and if I'm late, I expect them to have resolved it while I was in the air, okay? But they don't, okay? Especially not in Europe, especially across the different airlines, and especially not at Heathrow Airport. But I don't think Heathrow is as much of an anomaly as you would like to think. I think, sadly, they don't use technology in that way. Um, and I connect first thing to the Wi-Fi, but not everybody does, right? Okay, um, this is the depart, so once you've checked in at the conformance desk, that's where you actually did scan your, your boarding pass and your barcode, then you are get um, channeled into two main kind of routes. If you're staying within uh, the UK, if you're staying domestically, you go through immigration. If you don't stay domestically, then you have to kind of go through a, a, another security kind of screening and wait in the retail and lounge areas until you board your connecting flights. We're just focusing on connecting passengers here because of the volume of connecting passengers and because of the complexity and so many decision making, making moments that we have along the way, okay? And so the notion is, is that there's so, there's so little data that even finding a way for me to calculate that, so my T, my delta T that I care to predict, the time in, the time it takes a passenger to arrive at the conformance desk is gonna be what I'm looking to predict in, in part of my algorithm. It, it was so hard for us to even measure because we had to combine multiple data sets to get it. And uh, what I'm defining as delta T is the time it takes you from when you land to when you get to the conformance desk. This journey is lost in the airport, okay? Meaning airlines and airports do not know how to track you during this process. And there is no single database that actually looks at who landed, who checked in, and who left the next day that actually puts all this information together. As you'll see in a moment, we had to combine and do some kind of uh, uh, games to, with several different databases to get that information even, okay? It is much less organized than you would hope. So hopefully I'm motivating that this is a necessary project, okay? And you're getting a sense for a little bit of the work that we, we started to do with them was to say, how can we measure this? What, how do you track these passengers? Where do you have this information documented? How can we combine this information? We were hoping to get enough information so we can come up with a predictive model answering the question, how, at what time would a certain passenger hit the conformance desk? Meaning, how long did it take them to get there? And then we could develop a model calculating the number of passengers that would make it to the different security stations to ultimately calculate the number of passengers that might be late. And I wanna know how many passengers are late because I wanna tell the airlines, don't wait, or wait to 10 minutes and there'll be you know, 10 more passengers that will make it. All of these decisions will be determined based on my models, okay? And so my first uh, prediction task, or my first kind of part of my model, will uh, come up with these 
uh, I don't, you can't see it from where you're sitting, but really what it is is for each passenger, I'm going to come up with an entire distribution, not just like the average time it's going to take, but an entire distribution of the fifth quantile, the 25th quantile, the 75th, the 95th, an entire distribution for when you might hit those conformance desks. How long is it going to take you? Yeah. Because I've been to Heathrow multiple times. So once you land, usually everybody goes straight forward to the connecting flight until you hit the conformance test. Usually, not always. What else do you do? You go to the bathroom. That's the only thing. There's no stands, no nothing. So else. it depends. So first, it depends if you're coming from Terminal Five or not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're coming from Terminal uh, Three or Two, Three or Four, you might end up do in different routes. Okay. Some of the spaces go through duty free. Some of the spaces don't go through duty free. It depends on where you land. But terminal Five. I um, before you show us, I can predict that you're gonna predict it very accurately because love I mean, it. Love it. And I love giving this talk to an audience that knows something about prediction because, of course, you're right, okay? So if they land in Terminal 5, I can be more confident in my prediction. It's still going to be useful information, but I can be more confident that I'm predicting them correctly, okay? Extension or nothing, I can just... All going to be variables in my model. All going to help me come up with a set of predictions. And remember, at the APOC level, when I'm sitting in the APOC, I have not one flight landing from from Logan, from Boston, right? I have multiple of these airplanes landing in multiple terminals at multiple gates, and I need to come up with a model that kind of puts everything together, okay? And tells me how many passengers am I about to get hit with? Is this area gonna get overcrowded or not? Should I open more desks and so on and so forth, okay? And you can't just like pay people to sit like when the flight door opens and just like, because you could track them completely, right? You could track their trajectories if you instrumented them, right? You could, what, pay the people? Yeah, I'm just saying like, to, until you develop, say, another set of <laughs> parameters to correlate it with, like density from auto segmentation for the video feeds, right? Because you have every corner of that place. You could imagine you could build a say, auto segmented density map and then just pay runners to like sit at different times. No, I mean, you do it yeah, for yeah, a, yeah, 100 can, days or something, right. right? You probably could populate the model. So you can do, so something. they've experimented with a lot of different things, okay? So it's not as if they haven't tried to yeah, do yeah. anything. They've experimented, they've had all these types of like um, visual like heat readers that would measure the density of the, of the number of people in a space based on the heat on the heat that gets projected, and that would be communicated back to the APOC to get a sense for, for again, the density in the, in the security space, the density in the conformance area. They've tried a lot of different things, and this in and of itself, or maybe I'll take this opportunity to say a bigger kind of vision of mine, this specific task is helpful and important to them, but in and of itself, it's not the end game. Okay, this whole process of us coming in and doing this specific prediction task was also to show capabilities and to say, hey, you guys need to work on your data, you need to talk to each other, you need to uniform, uniform your system so this can be trivial because it's ridiculous that it should be so painful. I'm not happy that it was this painful. I'm just saying that's part of the outcome and the benefit that they got along the way. And you'll see the tremendous progress from when we started, which was Excel-based, as you can tell, to where they ended up, which is a much more sophisticated system. Okay, so the vision is, yes, this is a focal, could it be solved in other ways, potentially, but this is part of a bigger initiative here. Okay, other questions? We're good? Have you thought about Sheffield and you dug into that without the upstream distribution work Which around it? Say like, that again? Uh, like Little's Law, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you looked at that in terms of the, just, Simplify the number of parameters and then you go yeah, crazy. Yeah, so, so Little's Law. Little's Law. People know Little's Law? No. So Little's Law, this is an operations. It's a relationship between uh, throughput time and, and the rate of arrival and the time in the system and the number of uh, people in the system. We could theoretically use Little's Law to calculate what we expect to happen. But Little's Law, like a lot of other operational concepts, is an average, okay? So it, it, it doesn't take into account variability. So if I'm predicting a quanta, my, my upper tail here, passengers that take a long, 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 long time, that is lost for Little's Law, okay? And passengers that are taking very speedy time, all of the variability is gone using Little's Law because it's a theoretical construct that focuses on averages, okay? So we could use it to get some benchmark, but it's still not gonna answer the, the question. Okay, so that was the first challenge was to calculate the time it takes us to get to that conformance desk. And then with those predictions, we're gonna use our model and our distributions 
to calculate the number of passengers that are going to make it to either immigration or main, mostly the security screening. Again, we're going to come up with predictions that are quantile, that are full distributions of the number of passengers that are going to be in these different areas. Okay? So that's the task. That was our challenge. This is what we're going to uh, focus on. And this is how we use the data to come up with two predictions. A time prediction for an individual, how long I think it's going to take them, and then the number of passengers that is going to get to, to the security desk. And so for the rest of my talk, the results that I'm going to show, remember that there's two prediction tasks that we're, we're dealing here with. Uh, one is time, and another is number of passengers. Okay. Okay, so um, just to say, and I'm going to kind of go through this real quick in the matter of time, we're, we're not the first to do interesting stuff in the airspace. In fact, this is like the cherry, uh, uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say that our work is the cherry, but like this is just another step in, the, in, in a big, big literature that has to do with uh, the operations of airports and, air, and the airspace. Um, most of the work that has been done in this space has been focused on the airlines, meaning focused on the scheduling of the airplanes, focused on the airspace, how do I kind of route the airplanes in the right way, how do I account for extreme weather conditions. So everything to do with the airplanes themselves, either from an airport perspective or from the airlines perspective. Very little has been focused on us, the passengers, okay? And focusing on trying to understand the behavior or predict anything to do with the passengers. What has been done at the passenger level, there's been a few, uh, a few things that have been done, but again, not in the same way. Um, uh, the 2014 operations research paper looks at a multinomial logit model. Uh, they look to come up with really, uh, the, basically, the entire demand of the network and itineraries for the individuals. And they come up with itineraries that look at, on average, where in those itineraries are there big pockets of delays from kind of the entire network perspective. And then the other paper looks, again, at kind of, uh, uh, they try to predict um, the demand for a certain leg in a hub and spoke kind of infrastructure. So they look at the passenger perspective only to come up with like a demand assessment for a specific uh, uh, a leg in a hub and spoke. Not at all what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to an individual level prediction, a passenger level prediction for their activity and their whereabouts in the airport. If you want to generalize this um, work and say, where else can we use this type of model? Then I would say, for instance, uh, you know, any kind of transportation hub or center like um, uh, rail stations and so on might find this helpful, but also hospitals. So I've been talking a lot with different hospitals that are trying to use this type of model to predict the flow of a passenger through, uh, through the ICU or through uh, their operations. And recently I've been talking with a few folks who are trying to predict the spread of diseases in airports and, um, and in travel because you can again link the spread of a certain kind of, uh, you know, certain um, viruses to the flow of the passengers who arrive and depart from certain airports in different countries. And so it's been a very interesting and not expected use of our model. Question? And, and it's very interesting. It's almost like steady state because imagine like you had a tumultuous situation like when that uh, volcano occurred in, uh, in Iceland, right? Mm -hmm. you, so under normal conditions, you'd say, I want to minimize or I want to, there's an optimal time for the person to stay in the queue, right? You, you want to, because the interaction with the commercial parts of the airport, right? But then maybe even under congestion stress, you just want to get them the hell out, right? right. Like in some, so under normal, I guess that's the, the other embedded assumption in this. Well, it's interesting because under normal conditions, yes, but we also want to make this, we, one of our challenges or one of the things that we were trying to do here was create a model that is as real time as possible. So we could retrain and rerun our model very quickly getting feeds from real-time data as they became uh, available. And so that would allow me to take into account even extreme conditions because I'm getting that information real-time from the ground, okay? Of course, it requires that real-time data to be available, and you'll see that we help them push the needle on that as well, okay? But the idea is that this model gets rerun and retrained using the data live and predicting for, for everything for the flow currently in the airport. It's not like something that I run in on a training set and then just use throughout. Okay. Yeah. Um, general question. I mean, there's there's another another couple places where this locational information exists. Uh, um, Google for one. Um, 
for all Android users and even a lot of iPhone users, has pretty good information about where many, many people are at any given moment. Right. Um, the whole sharing business is another question. Right. But EU, now, Britain is, may not be part of the EU, but they're it getting pretty serious. Today. Yes, right. exactly. I just read a wonderful book by another, someone else at the business school called Surveillance Capitalism. Yep. It's fantastic. Um, and then there's- He's at the loss. Then there's Apple. The loss yeah. And there, and there's also the cell phone companies, yeah. the cell phone towers. Yep. And so checking in, checking out. There's a record there. I mean, people use cell phone data to, to look at flows. And that, this has been done, you know, worked on now for the last 10 years or- That's years. definitely so, true. He, no, he, he, just another, it could be, it could be his information on historical patterns that you could use to test your models. It could be conceivably used for real time. Just eventually, yeah. eventually, it might be used for real time, and, and, and bodies like Heathrow might become more comfortable relying and using on that data. Right now, they don't have the capability to do that. Not to, I mean, they don't have the capability to, to aggregate it, nor do they have the knowledge or the ability to do it real time yet. But you're right. That's a great, a great idea and inspiration. I think it goes back to Peter's point to say, this is something that maybe in the future we would hope to see, OK? That, that almost kind of turns the problem on its head to say, we need to go back and say, what data do we need in order to solve our problem? And right now, they're focused on what data do we have, OK? And so bridging that gap and pushing them to say, we need to think about data in a different way is really important. And your suggestions are, are very useful, OK? Was there another question? So, yeah, well, not a question, but in, in the hospital, um, that's the big thing is, uh, if it's a busy hospital, then how do you maximize uh, the patient population so you don't end up sticking patients in hallways or have empty beds. Right. And so to predict, you know, when is a patient actually going to be discharged and uh, when is our new patients going to be coming in? So that would uh, be a very important question to answer. And in fact, in hospitals these days, everything gets scanned a thousand times. And so there's a probably an easier way for me to track the, 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 the location of the passengers because they get con or the, of the patients because they're constantly being tracked internally. So I can I stand a chance to develop those models more readily. Okay. Right. And, and nowadays they're starting to do stuff with Bluetooth and right. actually know where a patient is. Right. You know, but there's still a lot of paper and a lot of, you know, kind of things that you can't quite put your finger on. So. Uh, thank you for those, uh, those proposals. They're uh, great suggestions. I'm going to uh, just speed up a little bit so I can make sure that I finish on time. But, uh, but, but these are great ideas. Um, so this is what we did. This is what we ended up doing. And this is what, how we ended up designing our model with the data that we had. So we ended up working with 3.7 million records of passengers. This was basically covering a whole year worth of activity. Not too much seasonality here. Uh, there's weekly seasonality. We'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, we used 3.7 uh, million records, 60% of which we took for training, 20% uh, for validation, and 20% for testing. Um, the median connection time through Heathrow was around 27 minutes, and the mean was 31 minutes, so pretty fast, actually. Um, we had 33 variables, meaning 33 uh, variables, information about the, the individual level passenger, for instance, their, dest their origin, their destination, um, what class they were sitting in, um, uh, what airplane they were on, and so on and so forth. Uh, some, some variables related to the passenger, some variables related to the airplane and aircraft and airline, and some variables that were airport related, meaning where in the which gate and which dock were they, and which stand were they allocated to, and where was their departing flight going to be from? We engineered a few new features, um, the, like the region. We coded the regions, inbound and outbound. And it turns out, you know, if you start to think about it, different incoming flights and outbound flights may have different characteristics in terms of the the pace in which people walk through the airport. Okay, um, of course, which class you sat in is going to be impactful, and so on. The hour of the day might matter to your, pa your pace and how, uh, how stressed you are. Like, what is your sense for how late you are going to be? That dictates how fiercely you walk or not. Once Atticus missed his flight, like, perhaps you're like, totally the opposite and you're walking very slowly because you know you missed your flight. So it depends on the punctuality uh, and the perceived connection time uh, that you have. Three databases were used. 
Uh, one database comes from the baggage handling system, so the bags are actually tracked pretty well. So we know where the bags leave and where they're about to go to because they have their final destination and they do get scanned, a little bit like in the hospital, they get scanned a lot more frequently than we do as passengers, okay? Yes, we could use cell data and so on and so forth, but there's no like actual scanning going on and the bags do get scanned all the time when they're on the plane, off the plane, and so on and so forth. So we use the baggage system, we use the conformance. The conformance data is the data that BA or the airline has. And then we used something called the BOSS system, which has basically some kind of documentation of the, all the flights that landed and the connecting passengers in them. That's what we used mainly to train the data, backwards looking, not real time data necessarily. Um, significant predictors that we came up with, starting with those 33 and, and taming it down using uh, all types of, types of kind of uh, machine learning algorithm. We, we found that there were 10 significant predictors. Some of them are fairly obvious, like for instance, um, uh, the stand, how far away is your stand from the main uh, conformance desk? Is it one of these that you need to bus? We heard here of somebody stuck on a bus for a long time, right? Either one of those that you need to be bused to or one of those that you can walk from. Uh, the hour of the day makes a difference, the punctuality, and so on and so forth. And eventually we identified something, 47 different categories, passenger categories, almost like a profile of a passenger. If they're arriving from a certain region, they're about to depart to a different region, you know, on a, a flying business and so on and so forth, we call that a category. So we segmented our passengers into these 47 different categories, and that's going to help us predict how long it's going to take them. So if you get nine and eight and multiply them, would you do the same result? Say that again? If you multiply nine and eight together. Nine, just multiply that? Well, we were using nonlinear, we were using regression tree techniques, so we didn't try, that already accounts for those interactions by themselves, so I didn't have to do anything linearly or try. The total number of passengers, right? it would, yeah, it would give me the nine and an inbound load factor and the body type. Yeah, I could, uh, for all the different aircrafts at the different type, it could come up with another variable. I think leaving them separately meant that we could se separate them and have interactions with other features in our model because that's what a regression tree really does. It allows us to interact those variables in creative ways so we don't have to worry too much about the interactions ourselves, but we let the model take care of that for us, okay? And so what a regression tree, which I'm sure you're all familiar with these types of techniques, really it's, in, it's kind of a, a you know, it's, it, basically, it categorizes our passengers by asking all these questions into buckets that identify them as a segment, okay? And so, for instance, are you arriving at Terminal 5? As we know, that's going to be really important. Is it, are you business class, yes or no? Domestic flight, yes or no? And so on and so forth. You get that segment that characterizes your connection type, yeah. Uh, regression trees are very uh, unstable, and it sounded like you have very noisy data. Yes, yeah. great Do question. You... Do you deal with that anymore? Yeah, so what we did next is we ran a lot of different tests for our model, okay? So we tuned it very carefully, we tested a little, uh, various combinations of our regression tree, and we also benchmarked it against uh, uh, many, many different alternative algorithms. So let me show you a few algorithms that we tested it against, okay? So what we tested it against are the following. So for the connection times model, we tested our models against one, two, three, four, five, five different types of benchmarks. Okay, we looked at just the naive forecast. What would happen if I just took last year's prediction? Okay, we looked at just the linear model with not all interactions accounted for because otherwise it would have exploded on us, okay? We looked at uh, quantile regression, gradient boosting machine, quantile regression force, different algorithms that can give me the entire distribution that are known to be better, actually, more accurate and more stable, okay? Regression trees are very crude. They're not always that stable and um, they're not as accurate as alternatives. But what they are is fairly transparent, easy to use, and very quick to run. And so we tried to stabilize our tree, and the way that we tried to stabilize our regression tree because of the features that we liked in it, that it and its superiority to the other alternatives, we tried to stabilize it by looking at not going as deep in our tree as we could, because going deeper means that you're segmenting it into multiple buckets that are very fragile. So we try to have fewer, um, less depth and fewer X variables in our tree. And we try to test those settings and choose those variables in a way that we have 
fairly little difference among the different trees that we generated if we did this multiple time out of sample. So we came up with a process to define what we call a stable tree to kind of address some of those concerns, okay? And so when we did this and compared to benchmark models, and again, if you're doing machine learning, you understand these models. If not, I'm happy to provide more detail. Uh, I'm not sure that this is the place, but it's all in the paper and I can give you, I can spend more time one-on-one. -on -one. But we compared to all these benchmark models and we used several different measures to measure accuracy of our model versus the alternatives. We used measures of accuracy of the point, the, ab the average forecast, that's my MAE. And we used measures of, of accuracy that look at the entire distribution. There's two measures of accuracy that we looked at in terms of the entire distribution, hit rates, how well calibrated my forecast is, and the pinball loss function. The pinball loss function basically gives me a different score for every quantile in my distribution. So I'm scoring these predictions in many different ways using fairly robust kind of tools, and I'm doing this all on a test set out of sample to see how, how good my predictions are. Go ahead. If you say regression trees are good for identifying features, couldn't you just extract the features that you got, use those for a more robust model? So we could, but it turns out that the regression tree was pretty good. Like, you, we could. So is this compared to for example, slapping linear regression on the naive features or using the features identified by the regression? This is using linear regression, using everything, okay? So we tried to be fair. We tried to test a lot of different combinations to give the other alternatives a fair shot. And again, kind of taking in mind that also the people that we ultimately hand this over to need to use this on a regular basis and need to kind of feel comfortable with what we're providing. That's and they, wouldn't they be more comfortable with linear regression? Uh, they could, but then you, you might end up in the space where you need to add so many interactions that it ends up being actually much more complex than a simple linear regression, okay? Yeah. And you, <coughs> or training. This is on testing. And you need to make sure, just one other comment, and I saw that there was a hand there, you also need to make sure that this can run in reasonable time over and over in production in real time, okay? So we're trying to account for all of these different characteristics. We were willing to give up some accuracy. We were willing to give up some clarity. We, all of these features are nice to have. It's the combination that, you know, speed of, of, of retraining, ease of understanding, and accuracy. And it, lo and behold, we get pretty good. Not perfect, but we get pretty good. Okay, question. Yeah, and as you kind of bucket these, you know, pa passengers, as it were, into groups, and it self-defined, you would probably want to do over time longitudinally, right, for seasonality and for other reasons. Okay, so let me get to the next. So that's a great question. This model is just predicting time at the conform conformance desk. Where I really want to look at where I could start thinking about time series models or where I could start thinking about some kind of uh, model that just looked at like yesterday's connection times is not so much around the time of connection but the number of passengers. There I can start building a time series approach. And so when we connect, this is predicting connection times. Now I'm going to move to predicting a uh, number of passengers arriving in the space, okay? So I'm going to just skip this for a second. I'll explain it uh, uh, verbally. But when we looked at number of arrivals, we call this passenger flows, here is where now we can start thinking about using some kind of time series component because I have the numbers and it's not at an individual passenger level, but now I'm looking at a total number of passengers that arrived in the space. And here the benchmark models are different, including a time series model, okay? So uh, my TBATS model here is an exponential smoothing model. It's a fairly sophisticated model that is used in these contexts. It allows me to account for single seasonality, double seasonality, time of day, day of week, all of these features that might be important. And we threw it into the mix, okay? Now, when I'm predicting the number of passengers, not the connection time of an individual passenger, but when I'm predicting the number of passengers that arrive in a space, here suddenly I may also want to um, remember that people travel together. And actually, what happens when people travel together in terms of their flow through the airport? If you're traveling with a group or with your family, what typically happens to you? You slow, slow. You slow down, right? And so taking into account the fact that sometimes people travel with kids or with families or together, that kind of changes the pace in which they progress. We wanted to make sure that we took that into account. And so when we predicted the number of passengers arriving in the conformance area, we wanted to add a correlation for all those passengers coming in those groups, okay? 
And so the way that we did this is we did this with a Coppola-based approach. We generated a correlation because we didn't have any kind of specific number. And so these models are refined to the fact, or they try to take into account the fact that people travel together, and if they're coming on the same flight and they're coming in the same class and they're going to the same destination, they're probably going to share some properties. When we do that, our results are really very promising, again, in terms of accuracy and in terms of uh, um, how easy it is to interpret. And so both in terms of the distribution and in terms of the point estimates, again, we're hitting it pretty well, we're pretty accurate, and our performance is, is, is nice to kind of rely on to say these models are robust, they perform well out of sample, and we can use them in practice. Uh, just kind of in a matter of time to make sure that I wrap up on time, I'm going to skip some of the, of the other details here, but if you're interested in, in, in probabilistic forecasting, if you do probabilistic forecasting, we have a lot of interesting ideas and results here related to measuring the, the, the quality of our probabil probability forecast. When we work with probabilities, not point estimates, but probabilities, we want to make sure that our probabilities are well calibrated, they're performing well, and we see these these measures, these PIT charts to measure, is it overconfident, underconfident? Again, I, I can go into that if you're interested. That's something that I do a lot of my, my own work on. But just so you know that we're subjecting all of this analysis to these types of, of tests to try and improve the calibration and the quality of our forecast. OK, these are some uh, uh, just, again, benchmarking against alternative. We're benchmarking here against the time series and against other alternatives. We're trying to balance out not only, whoops, not only uh, the point estimates, which is, let me see, not only the, the, the kind of line here where my predictions are, the darker line in the middle. I don't know if you guys can see the darker kind of dotted line, my point estimates, but I'm also trying to get right my entire distribution, my entire range. This is too narrow. These are uh, overconfident predictions that are too narrow and too exact. And this is the right, uh, you know, I want to add some degree of uncertainty. This might be too wide. This is definitely too wide. And so we need, and our regression tree approach allows us to find just the right balance of coming up with the point estimates and the right kind of distribution around it to depict correctly our uncertainty in these predictions so we get a sense for how much variability is still left. Okay? We ran this model live with, the, uh, with Heathrow Airport. With the APOC, we were there live, run, retraining our model and coming up with predictions live, uh, using the information that was available on the ground. Okay, the information on the ground that we get comes from a system or comes from messages that the air, airplanes automatically send the airport when they take off. These are called P, uh, uh, PTM messages. Okay, so passenger transfer messages. These messages come like almost like in like little messages. Uh, routinely, they sent, be, get sent automatically when the airplane is in the air by the airline or by the airplane to the APOC. These messages are simplistic, but they're also hugely variable. It turns out that they're not that reliable because different airlines use different constructions of the P PTMs. They send the PTMs at different times. They don't always, uh, they're not always there available when we want to make my pre our predictions. So say we wanted to run our model two hours before and get a prediction for what's about to happen two hour, in the next two hours, not all airlines and airplanes have sent these PTMs. And so there was a real need to get everybody on board and to say, we need to start sending these PTM, these messages, to, at the same time in a very consistent way to make sure that we all are standardized and can work together to use this information in a useful way. Okay? This shows you just how basic and old-fashioned some of these systems are. And so one of the insights that they had, and they publicized it throughout, was these PTMs need standardization. Okay? <laughs> what do these PTMs show? These PTMs are showing where, what flight you're coming in. Where, these are all transfer passengers. So where, what flight are you about to go to? Who are you traveling with? What seat you're sitting in? And how many pieces of luggage do you have? Okay? And that's the information I'm supposed to use in order to start predicting my to use in my model. Are they on your internal air traffic control system? So here's a plot. That's exact. Thank you for the question because uh, it perfectly timed. This is a distribution of the minutes before check-in that these PTMs were received. As you see, there's a big, big, big inconsistency as to when exactly they they are there. Okay. 
typically most of them are there within about two hours, two hours before uh, they land, okay? But it's not always the case, okay? They could sometimes send them at different points in time. They could send them in fragments. They could resend them later. They send them twice. There's a lot of issues with those PTMs. There's correlations between that sending behavior and which airline does it? I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not. So they, model yes, you could model that. They did not tell us anything. They, I'm sure that Heathrow folks have that in the back of their mind. They know more about the nuances than I do. But I'm not. They didn't mention any specific airline. You know, they can't say anything bad about BA, right? No, but they could put a penalty in landing. They could. Place. They could. They could. They could. Mm -hmm. They could. Um, and so just to kind of wrap things up, I want to tell you that today, so this is kind of uh, the state of where things are now. Um, we finished this project, we did our live trial, we tested it, things were looking very promising. Heathrow Airport totally bought into the fact that they could improve the way that they think about their data, the way that they store their data, and the way that the databases communicate to each other to come up with prediction models like the one that we developed for them. And so what they did is they really hired a brand new team, folks who are a lot more, um, who basically are equipped to deal with, with all of the types of solutions that people in academia think are so easy to kind of come up with. They hired a bunch of new folks who knew something about this, okay? They took our model and they basically rewrote it. They now became experts in using systems that uh, could use R and Python and coding in a much more sophisticated manner. They were able to not only fit a certain distri one distribution that we used in our prototype, but they now look at those kind of segments and they fit a bunch of different families of distributions to identify for each segment what distribution fits. They implemented the system and they ran it and they reported huge benefits in terms of their control of what's going on at the airport. Uh, we, we've been trying to press them for a number, like I want a dollar value. Uh, they haven't necessarily been able to give me a dollar value in terms of the improvement, but the, the proposals and the indication is, is that this has really uh, improved the experience of the passenger, but also improved the APOC operation to a great degree. And other airports are now working uh, uh, with this model, trying to implement it uh, throughout their airports, including all of the, the Paris airports, which we're very really excited about. Um, so that's all I've got right now. Uh, I'll leave my conclusions up there. The conclusions have to talk about, you know, uh, some of the, the, the softer sides of the struggles of putting together a project like this, but also some of the technical challenges uh, and some of the things that we think that we've contributed. So I thank you for your questions and for your time. And if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, shoot me an email and we can uh, set up some time to talk about it in more depth. Thank you. Um, so this is, yeah, approximately in a year. That's their estimate. I can't tell you that that has been proven in no, any way, shape, or form. I mean, it's basically 1% increase in accuracy is worth $200,000. Okay. Basically. Right. Well, so, yes, well, right. For this specific yeah. prediction task, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. yes. I have one question. So when yeah. you show the results. <laughs> yes. Uh, Which result? Do you want me to go back? The accuracy results? Yeah, the accuracy results. So these are for the... Yeah, it's okay there. So I'm trying to understand the accuracy in actual physical units. I take a selfie and you get five dollars. The accuracy in... In minutes. In minutes. So it's probably the best to look at uh, the mean absolute error. So so in, thi so in this, let me go back. In this prediction, connection times, MAE, that's the mean absolute error, right? Is that minutes? It is minutes because it's absolute error, but yes. it's the mean absolute error. Well, it could be hours, I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, it's minutes. It's minutes. Definitely minutes. <laughs> Remember, we're talking here about um, average is about 30 minutes connection time, so the whole scale is in minutes, yeah. I'm trying to see if that's... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's a good question. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, Joseph, or Joseph. Joseph. Joseph.